So my our next speaker is uh, Hugo Perigo. Is that how we pronounce it? That's good. That's good. He said. <laughs> not, not best, but good. And he's a population geneticist who is currently um, at the uh, a visiting scientist at the University of Perugia, 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 in Italy, and is also a director of the LDS Rome Institute uh, campus. So, uh, he has uh, had a PhD in genetics and biomolecular studies from the University of Pavia, and um, was part of the team who, who identified genetic diversity among Native American populations in the uh, early 1990s. Uh, that, that was my, my mentor, I did that in the 20s, and in the 1990s ah, I went to yeah. I was okay. in high school. Well, I, <laughs> so, uh, uh, the I didn't write that. Further ado, we'll, we'll turn the time over to you. Okay, I just need some help to turn this on. <laughs> Bryce, how do I turn everything on? Okay, computer right here. Thank you. Yeah, you got it. Okay. Well, first of all, I'm very grateful to be here today, and I want to thank the organizer for uh, being brave enough to fly me out here from Italy. Um, a couple of days ago, before I was getting ready to leave, my 11 years old son, who is a, a very straightforward with things he has to say, uh, he asked me this very sincere question. I said, Dad, tell me the truth. They're really inviting you there because they want to hear your cool accent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, that's my contribution to the symposium today. <laughs> so um, I really can only talk about what, what, I, what I'm doing. You know, um, we have some really good stuff that was shared this morning by brother Guy uh, Gonzalo Magno, and I'm sure I'm the best one to say his last name here, <laughs> and uh, also by Jim Falconer, um, this whole nature about um, uh, what, what is a man and, and uh, the dualism part of it, and uh, I'd like to just add some to it with regard to um, a genetic perspective, and, um, and understand this, I, uh, and I said that before, you know, I work full time for seminaries and institute. I'm a bishop in Rome. I'm the director of the seminary and institute program at the, the campus in Rome. But yeah, at the same time, I do genetics and science and, and I have collaborations. And, and uh, so a lot of the times you kind of have to keep them a little bit separated. Sometimes, you know, bring them together. And uh, like Guy said this morning, you know, we really don't have to die over trying to reconcile everything because science doesn't know everything and religion has not revealed a lot of the things either. So we just have to sit and relax and enjoy the ride. You know, that's kind of what we, what we need to do. So what I'll talk today a little bit is, uh, first of all, I'm gonna set my personal frame of reference and uh, um, I took the title from, um, for my presentation, I, I stole it from uh, Armand Maus, um, Armand Maus book, Our Abrams Children, where he, he does a very good and a um, great job um, in talking about this whole issue with Mormonism and, uh, and race and identity and lineages and so on. So I'm just going to, uh, I'm assuming that some of you might be familiar with some of these things because they're part of our theology. And then what do they mean with regard, you know, what science is really telling about us? So uh, what can DNA tell us about us and how close are we related and then talk a little bit about our ancient ancestors. So uh, as a theological frame of reference, you know, we need, to, to uh, and I'm sure most of you in this room knows that, but you know, when you go to a regular Sunday school, it's not like that. Um, to understand that the church does not have an official position about um, what uh, happened at the time of Adam and Eve or before the time of Adam and Eve with regards to uh, biological uh, events. So, this, can, this was a great statement in the new era last month. And I love that it says, you know, there'll be no revelation on this question. The scientific evidence says yes, with regards to things that happened on this earth a long time before uh, Adam and Eve. And uh, the details of what happened on this planet before Adam and Eve aren't a huge doctrine or concern of ours. Now, I don't know, the article wasn't signed and I don't know what ours is. I'm assuming <laughs> ours as the church, we shouldn't, you know, be too concerned about that. Yet, yet we can speculate and talk about it. 
The accounts of the creation in the scriptures are not meant to provide a literal scientific explanation of the specific processes, time periods, or events involved. So we can really talk a lot about, you know, like I, I was thinking about another title for my presentation, Much Ado About Nothing, you know, really. <laughs> you can really talk a lot about things that have, are just assumptions or thoughts or, or consideration that we need to make. But this is important. This kind of goes hand in hand with the 1910 statements by the first presidency. Uh, that was put in the uh, improvement era where um, the first presidency at that time, a year earlier, made up, um, they, they came out with the, um, the Declaration on the Origin of Man, which is, uh, I think, is still given at BYU um, when you start uh, as a freshman. They give you this packet on evolution. They still do that. And, um, and uh, <clears throat> by 1910, they corrected a little bit uh, the target and they say, you know, we really don't know, and that's, you know, what the first president say, if man was created from the elements of the earth or if he was transplanted from another planet or if he was the result of natural evolutionary processes. So they pretty much, what did they do? They just opened all the doors and they just let all kind of wind to come in, you know, and say, you know, we just don't know. And uh, so that's this important frame of reference. And we talk a lot about this, uh, um, Jim Falkerman sp spoke about that, you know, we, we don't understand um, things like, you know, um, guy, guy actually said that, you know, what does it mean to be creating the image of God? What, what does it really mean to be in the image of God? You know, without a leg, we're still being the image of God, you know. Um, what does it mean to be created from the dust of the earth? What does it mean to have the breath of life put in? And uh, what is the difference between having a soul and having a spirit? And uh, one of my greatest mentors in, uh, in my, my um, science um, career, if you will, uh, was Scott Woodward, who used to be a professor at BYU. And he's the one that shared this ancient Egyptian tradition with me where um, Egyptians used to believe or have this tradition where a man was made of many different elements. And if you didn't have one of these elements, what was that you had? So, you know, you needed to have intelligence, you need to have a heart, you need to have a brain, you need to have, I mean, there was like a whole shopping list, you know, you need to have a shadow, you need to have a soul, you need to have a body, right? And so what if you have all these elements, but you're missing one of them? Like, what if you have uh, a body and a, and a shadow and a brain and a heart, but you don't have a spirit, uh, just like a, a human spirit, you know? Would that be... What would that be, you know? And so why would, why would you have a list of all these things, you know, to, to have that? So that's, that's things like yours to consider. Like, what, was Adam any different than anyone that was, uh, I mean, first of all, was there other people, other human-like individuals at this time? Were there anyone before that? And how would that have been different from Adam? And uh, why was Adam chosen and uh, identified as our um, first father and so on and so forth? So those are like all... For things that we need, you know, we need to understand, we don't, need, we don't really have all the answers for that. <clears throat> now, as Latter day Saints, though, we, um, we put a lot of emphasis about the uh, concept of, uh, of our divine and, uh, um, uh, you know, how we are our divine identity, how we are uh, God's in embryo, how we are part of the house of Israel, how we receive patriarchal blessings that assign us to a particular lineage. So we put a lot of emphasis on that. Why is that? Because uh, we know that uh, there were certain blessings given, certain promises given to Hebron regarding his posterity. Yeah, we trace our, um, uh, when we do these things that, that is very peculiar to our religion, to, assign, to do patriarchal blessings uh, and assign somebody to a lineage, we kind of uh, go back to, to Jacob, you know, but the reality is that we're trying to fulfill Abram, um, uh, to assign somebody to Abram's house. And yet, we know that it's not only Abram's descendants that are part of the house of Israel, because Abram had a lot more descendants than just those that were part of the house of Israel. And even more, there were people that were born between Adam and Abram's time that I am pretty sure they're also entitled to the same blessings if at some point they're given the opportunity <laughs> to live them. So, for example, in Peter, we read that uh, Christ went to preach the gospel in the, spirit, in the spirit prison. And to who did he preach that gospel? To the people that live at the time of Noah, right? That was, which was before Abraham. So why would they be preached uh, the gospel? And who, first of all, who's going to do the temple work for them? Because, you know, you need to, to, to do both. So 
you know, um, but we, we emphasize this fact that, and, and this has changed. This is, a, um, this is something that has changed over time. I'm going to talk a little bit in the next slide about that. But um, right now, the position of the church is everyone that keeps the commandments, that live the gospel, is entitled of Abraham's blessing, right? It doesn't matter what, what race or lineage you are, you know, it's going to be working for you. So everyone from the time of Adam, because he had the gospel all the way down to our present day, as long as you at some point to live these things, you are going to receive these blessings. So what does it mean then to be part of the house of Israel? What does it mean to be a descent of Abraham? Who is a descent of Abraham? Who is not? And uh, this has changed in, in uh, this again, is, we're, we're still in the part of the frame of reference, but this is uh, from uh, uh, Armand Moss book that uh, he is interview a number of different patriarchs. And uh, this is from his second chapter. And uh, there was not a patriarch that was consistent in explaining what does it mean to be assigned to a particular lineage. Uh, although sometimes they choose wording, they say like, you are a literal. You know, how many of you have that in your patriarchal version? It says you are a literal descendant of, you know, the literal part. You have the literal word in it? So, you know, so, so some people say that, but Joseph Smith himself was teaching that what happened when you get baptized? That your blood changes, right? If, that your blood changes. Now, this is a very simple, you know, we're talking, we're talking about the scientific method, right? <laughs> it's a very simple experiment to do. You know, you take somebody who wants to get baptized, you draw a sample of blood the day before he gets baptized and a sample of blood after, and then... You know, you, you, you run the DNA sequence on that, or you do a blood type, or whatever you want to do. And I, I can guarantee you that probably 100% of the time, you will not see any meaningful difference. So why did Joseph Smith say that? What did he mean to, you know? And, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, yesterday I was talking with Dee, and she said, you know, maybe there is something we cannot measure, you know, yet. Or there is some sort of changes that we don't have the, the, the tools or the instrument. Uh, too much, but he said that you know, and early leaders were emphasizing this blood lineage thing, you know. And Joseph Smith himself, uh, he knew and he thought and he um, and he taught to others that uh, he was a literal descendant of Joseph of Egypt. Why did he do that? Because in the Book of Mormon it says that in Second Nephi chapter three it says that from Joseph of Egypt there will be a Joseph that will restore the gospel, you know. So he was believing that uh, to be a, a true genealogical thing, a true genealogical connection. That's how early Mormons identify themselves a lot with these, uh, uh, with, with these lineages, with these descendants, to the, with this identity. Now, uh, Armand closes his chapter saying, the Abrahamic, the Abrahamic covenant is divine archetype rather than lineage-specific favoritism for all who accept Christ becomes Abraham's seed spiritually and receive the same blessings as his biological descendants. And that is the position we have now that has changed over time from the early part of Mormonism. So that is kind of like the, the frame of reference where we're dealing with. So, you know, trying to understand who we are, what defines us, you know, what does DNA say about that? So we have um, three different ways to... Uh, to test DNA for uh, for individual for both genealogy and population genetics, and uh, one of them is the Y chromosome, which uh, identifies as uh, uh, our paternal line, and then we have the mitochondrial DNA that identifies our maternal line, and then the majority of our DNA comes from uh, is found in the autosomes, which come from uh, a number of our ancestors, and uh, so these three methods uh, can be used to say something about an individual today. Um, so, in general, population genetics. You know, we it's proven through DNA that we are all descendants of uh, we all have African ancestry, right? And that's where life uh, um, as modern humans began. Uh, these are these uh, this is uh, as you can see from the shape is Africa, but these are uh, is a way to graph um, the presence of a particular allele, a particular gene that is found in this population. And so there is a lot of why this why these scientists believe that life starts in Africa is because that's where you observe the greatest variation with regard to DNA and, uh, and the oldest genetic lineages are found there. And then as you look at places outside of Africa, you start seeing that uh, everybody in the world genetically is a subset of the rich variety that you see in Africa. Even the color of our skin uh, recently has been discovered that uh, um, is a gene that uh, uh, has evolved or, or, or showed up only 8,000 years ago. The, the, the fact that we, are, uh, we have a light skin. So before that, there were no 8,000 years 
ago and, early, uh, and earlier, um, there was no such things as a, a lighter skin. So everyone is, a, is a, a basically of African ancestry and as DNA tells us that there was an African Adam and an African Eve. And uh, that's how they call them in science. You know, they use the name Adam and Eve. Now, they didn't live 6,000 years ago. They lived 100, 150,000 years ago. And they were not the only one, but they were the only one that were successful in propagating their DNA to the present day. And so what you can see here, um, this is mostly based on uh, uniparental marker, which is the Y chromosome and the mitochondrial DNA, which only tell us one line of our family tree. But it's since the DNA does not mix with other parts of the DNA, you can go back in time uh, thousands of years and link everybody on the planet uh, together along the paternal line or along the maternal line. And so what we're talking about, an Adam and an Eve that existed and that are our ancestors. They, that's where everyone on the planet today descends from these two people, uh, from the white chromosome and the mitochondrial DNA. It's because uh, everybody else were not successful in having offspring to propagate their DNA. So their lines eventually died out, mostly due to chance. And so, but we, we believe that we're all brothers and sisters and we all connect back, but the timing is a little bit different than what we would read in the Bible, which what we say in the new era, is we should not be taken literal some of these things. And so based on the DNA variation in the world, we're able to determine the migration and the population, um, how they expanded from continent to continent. And uh, we can tell from the genetic markers that we carry where our ancient ancestor came from. If they're from uh, uh, the Americas or from Africa or from uh, Western Europe or Eastern Europe or Asia or Australia or so on, uh, DNA tell us that because we can uh, compare the DNA with other populations in the world and see where uh, we fit. So this is my DNA. This is my autosomal DNA. So we're talking about one of those three markers that I told you about. And uh, it's about 700,000 pieces of DNA that have been analyzed. And what you can see from that, I am a, a pretty much 100% European, and the majority of that is uh, Southern European, which matches with my genealogy and my accent, right? So you got several level of, um, of, uh, of evidence about that. But what it gets interesting is that if I do an analysis of my paternal line, my straight paternal line, my Y chromosome, uh, belongs to a group called C, which uh, is only found in Asia. So based on my paternal genetic history, I'm not European, I am Asian, right? And uh, historically, um, there are um, events that I cannot prove genealogically, but that have happened in the history where Genghis Khan or the Silk Route or Attila the Han have actually made it all the way to Europe and my ancestors are from Northern Italy. So perhaps there was some sort of uh, uh, exchange there. Uh, I don't think there were consensual because uh, uh, Genghis Khan uh, was not known to be a gentleman, and I'm sure that uh, <laughs> those that were with him uh, um, pretty much following his footstep. But um, I have that legacy, which actually is pretty rare because in Italy about 0.01% I think belongs to the same lineage. So it's not something that is typical Italian. So um, that, that is something that tells something about myself. On my maternal line though, I'm, ni- I'm na- neither European nor Asian. I actually belong to a subgroup of K, which is closely affiliated to Ashkenazi Jews, which are the German Jews, which uh, also Albert Einstein belongs to the same uh, um, group. So I can claim, that's my claim to fame, is uh, to have a, a maternal ancestry that somehow connects it to, to his people, to him. And uh, so the question is, what, what am I? Okay, I know I belong to the house of Israel. I know that I am descendant of Abraham. My patriarchal blessing says on the house of, Israel, of Ephraim, right? On the lineage of Ephraim. And yet, what am I? Am I European? Am I Asian? Am I um, a, a Jew? Or, you know, if you look at my passport, am I American? You know, in the, for America, for the U.S. government, that's all I am. You know, forget about everything else. You know, the taxes are coming here. And so, <laughs> so it, I, I, you can see, you know, we, we have a very much different and unique uh, picture that DNA describes about ourselves, but also there are other components that we need to consider from a genealogical point of view. And this is a this is a simple mathematical um, calculation where it shows how many people in your pedigree you have. So we're used when we go in a, in a family history center to 
to get a family tree and uh, is a uh, is a form of a pyramid you know where you start you know with two three you know two four eight sixteen um, generations and uh, it keep expanding and opening but the point is that when you come to about this point right here between 10 and 15 generations in the past if you have european ancestry your pedigree start doing something like that you know start coalesce and uh, if if you these are the ancestors that a single individual would have if that would be successful in going back in time and fill every slot on the pedigree chart, which of course cannot happen, but you have to think about it. You know, what if we would have available every single genealogical information for everyone that, ever, that was ever born on this planet back 6,000 years? We have a complete pedigree for everyone, a complete records, nothing was lost. What, what would we do with that, with that information? If we have all the genealogy of everybody, what would, as a latter day saints, what are we expected to do? Temple work, right? You're supposed <laughs> to take this name to the temple, right? Which we're gonna talk a little bit about that because that's how people receive their blessings from Abraham, okay? And so, but the point is that uh, we we are so closely related to everyone that all of my ancestors are also everybody else's ancestors on this planet. I do not have unique ancestor, and this only happens you know, 15, 20 generations in the past for Europeans and you go back maybe another five generations and you have the whole world and everybody in the world because the number of people that live in the world, you know, if you go back uh, 10 years at a time, back in time, the number of the people decreases. We never had as many people on this planet that we have today. So 10 years ago, we have fewer, 20 years ago, fewer, 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 right? And scientifically, genetically, we know that there were only a small group of, of homo sapiens from where everybody uh, is descended. And yet, genealogically, we're going like this. So at a certain point, we reach a, a, some sort of plateau where everybody is related to everybody else. And all my ancestors are also everybody else's ancestors. And uh, why am I saying that? Because we are talking about this happening about 30, you know, 20, 30 generations ago. We're still talking about 700, uh, maybe top 750 years ago. So year 12, 1250 AD, right? And uh, when did Abraham live? When, when, is the, when is this date? It's about two millennia before Christ, right? About 4,000 years ago. So can you see that? The, the mathematical issues that we have here with all the people on the earth having all the same ancestors about 500 to 750 years ago, and yet we're talking about an individual where we're claiming descendancy from, or at least a unique descendancy, that lived 4,000 years ago, right? And so what does it tell us? You know, this is a, actually came out from a study from Harvard, but as Steve Olson talks about it, it says the mathematical study of genealogy indicates that everyone in the world is descended from Nefertiti, Confucius, everyone of European ancestry is descended from Mohammed or Charlemagne, and uh, of course, Abraham as well, right? Everyone in the world. As long as somebody in the past was successful in having a progeny and having offsprings that live to today, then we are all descendants of that individual. That's why all Native Americans are descendants of Lehi, genealogically, because he lived 2,600 years ago, so everybody has to be a descendant of him. So we were talking about temple ordinances, and I want to thank Dee for sending that to me last night. And uh, what does you need? What do we need to do temple ordinances? There is still some family search, but there are these parts that are interesting because to me have some sort of genetic connection. Our preeminent obligation is to seek out and identify our ancestors. So there is an issue with identity. Uh, we have to demonstrate biological connections and uh, uh, possible ancestors, meaning individuals who have a probable family relationship. So we need to demonstrate that we are related to them. Okay, so unique identity, biological connection, and uh, um, we are related. Can DNA help with that? You know, can we answer that question? So um, about um, 15 years ago or so, uh, the, the first human genome, that's what we are dealing with. You know, these, these are things that maybe a number of years ago, you know, was just sci-fi, sci uh, sci you know. But nowadays, um, we are getting to the point where you can send a thousand dollars to a lab and have your complete 3.2 billion pieces of information sequence. And your 3.2 billion pieces of information, your entire genome is unique to you. Not even identical twins have identical genomes, okay? Because there are things like uh, 
stress and, and uh, pollution that uh, tend to change a little bit of the DNA. I had two ladies, two twins, identical twins, uh, over my house for dinner uh, last, uh, last week, and they were in their 70s. And one of them has so, all sorts of health issues, was lactose intolerant and arthritis and everything. The other one didn't. You know, and uh, she said, well, I had, there were issues when I, during delivery, and so that it took longer for them to get me out. And so they think that the stress that the body experienced in those early, in a, those early minutes of, of her life has played that role in, a, in her life. So, but we can tell everybody is unique because of their DNA sequences. So how do we get DNA from people? There are two ways to do that. One is that we take DNA from living people and we compare it with each other, and then we reconstruct pieces of DNA, segments of DNA from individuals that live in the past. And I'm gonna show you a pretty neat picture next. Or we find somebody, some bones in, in, a, in a grave or in a, somewhere, you know, and, uh, and uh, we test them and we can uh, determine the unique genome of that person. So this is, uh, if you can see the date up here, that's last night, 7 p.m. last night. So that you're the first people that are seeing Emma and Joseph DNA. Okay, this is their autosomes, and uh, these segments that you see up here is DNA that either Joseph or Emma had in their body, and we did that. How do we determine that? Um, based on four descendants, two from Alexander Hale and two from Joseph Smith III, the, the two sons that uh, have a living posterity today. So based on only four people, we were able to reconstruct this much DNA for Joseph and Emma. Now, we can actually be specific with only Joseph, by, and, I, and I do have that DNA already, by testing some descendants of Hiram Smith. Because what Hiram and Joseph would have in common, not, and not with Emma, you would know that would be unique to Joseph. So you can take both of these. So what I'm doing here is that this DNA together is DNA unique to this couple. There is no one alive today that has all these segments in one genome. But there are people that have pieces of these genomes, and so as you put them together, you're creating a unique profile for an individual that lived in 1850s, in, you know, in the mid 19th century. So uh, we're all we're all different. We all look at different. We all sound different. You can tell from you know me speaking here, but the reality is that we are very similar genetically. Um, these are some of our closest relatives. Uh, we share 98 percent of our DNA with chimps and about 99.5% of DNA with Neanderthals. Okay, how do we know that? We're, we're gonna get to it, hopefully. Uh, um, okay, still a couple of minutes in the questions, but you don't have any questions, right? right? So, um, so of this 90% that we share with chimps, about one or eight percent that is left are, are mutations that are typical to our species, so every one of us have them. So that's what makes us homo sapiens and not apes. And uh, uh, some wife here might argue that, but uh, we, that's what it is. And, uh, and so we are left with a 0.1% that is all the variation that we see in, uh, among modern humans, but still accounts for about 3 million of possible mutations, okay? So we are more similar than we are different, and uh, we are very similar at populations, population with population, and with most of the differences are observed within the same population. We don't have time to talk about that. So I want to talk about our um, cousins. We're out of time, so we, I'm going to finish with this because this is where it kind of wraps things up, is, uh, is uh, about our cousins, the Neanderthal. And so these are the cavemen that we heard, you know, we saw uh, yeah, in the movies and everything. But um, very recently, you know, this, uh, this is uh, from last year, has been determined sequencing the complete genome of Neanderthals. We can do that. There is the technology to do that and the samples to do that. That uh, uh, we, uh, the, the scientists have been able to determine that there was crossbreeding between uh, our species and Neanderthal. And that each European or Asian uh, indi individual with, with ancestry from Europe or Asia carries between one to 4% of Neanderthal DNA. And just recently, it was thought to be only unidirectional, so only the Neanderthals contributed Neanderthal DNA to Homo sapiens. And now recently, with this sample that was found in Asia, uh, this is a, a toe from a, from a, um, uh, it's a toe bone, and uh, they, they saw that going both ways. So there was crossbreeding between the species, so bidirectional. So what happened here is that he said early Europeans may have had Neanderthal great-great-grandparents, meaning 
in your family, your family tree, your pedigree chart got all at once more interested because you got to add them to it. All right. <laughs> and there are services. This is with the National Geographic. You know, this is based on 150,000 pieces of DNA of SNPs and that can determine what is your percentage of Neanderthal compared to the, uh, the general population. So the average is about 2.1% on average. And uh, for, for Neanderthal, I carry about 0.9%. I know you, you, you cannot tell that, but that, <laughs> that, that, is, that is how much I carry. So I have that Neanderthal DNA in myself, and this is you know, what my pedigree chart would look like, and I'm glad I look what I, look, what I do and not that I look like this. But every morning I wake up and I feel like I'm looking more like that than this. But this is my tree. This is our tree. So now what are the questions that we... we um, I was going to talk a little bit about cloning, but I, I don't have time. But we can clone, we can create from these whole genomes, we can create, uh, we can synthesize chromosomes, and, and the scientists have already been able to do that, to create uh, artificial sequences of DNA from DNA of uh, a bacteria that has become extinct and put it in live bacteria. So we are recreating. So where ethically, you know, where do, where do we draw the line? Uh, is it okay to clone bacteria from ancient DNA? Is it okay to do that? with uh, uh, eukaryotic cells or multicellular organism, you know, because they're already doing that with yeast, which is made of cells similar to ours. How many of you would love to see a, a live mammoth? I mean, we're talking about Jurassic Park things, right? We cannot do dinosaurs because there is no DNA that we can recover from dinosaurs, but can we do that for mammoths? Yes, we can. Wouldn't it be great? Now, would it be ethical to do that for Neanderthals? Okay, we know that uh, we have issues if we'll be humans, right? If we're like us, but what about Neanderthals? Would it be ethical or not to do that? So where do we draw the line? Now, uh, this is King Richard. His body was discovered a couple of years ago and they did a complete sequence of his DNA and identified him. And uh, so should, should we do temporal work for King Richard? Yes, right? We should, because if there is somebody that is a descendant of King Richard related to him, we should do that. He was born in 1452, you know, it's part of that. So what about the Otzi, the Tyrolean Iceman? Have you ever heard of him, right? He's a famous guy. We have a complete genome for him. We know what, it, what was his last meal. Uh, we know what uh, the material that his shoes were made of. We know something about the weapons and that he, the technology that he had available and the color of his hair. I mean, we know more things about this man that lived 5,000 years ago that I know about my great-grandparents, okay? We know so much things. So can we do temple work for him? You know, should we do that for the Kennewick man, which was born um, in 8,500 years? So that's 2,000 years, maybe before Adam. But he was a homo sapiens, you know? And uh, we know things like uh, we know their names because we can create unique identifiers with their DNA. We, can, we know their gender because the absence of pre or presence of a uh, chromosome Y determines the gender. We know the place where, where they lived. We can determine the date through radiocarbon dating. So is that enough information to do temporal work for these people? You know, I don't know. Maybe it's a stupid question. But the thing is, some of these were born after Adam. Some were born right before. Some were born 50,000 years ago. At this these, uh, you know, Neanderthals, are, they are our ancestors, they are in my tree. When I got baptized, 0.9% of Neanderthal was baptized with me, right? So are they children of God or they are creatures of God? Do they have a spirit or do they have a soul? What people born 8,000 years ago, 15,000 years ago? And we, you know, we can accept um, th these all things about Abraham, right? And what, but, but the, the whole point is, I think there is a lot more questions that we are asking and that DNA is bringing to the table with regards to our personal identity. And I always love the Sistine Chapel painting, you know, with, with, with the Father Michelangelo who put the belly button on Adam, you know, because you, you know what that means. So this, <laughs> this is all I have. <laughs>
So Jews define Jewishness by maternal descent. There are there distinct mitochondrial classes that are distinct to Jews using yeah, well, Brian Sachs using Brian Sachs seven daughters seven daughters of it. Brian Sachs book is is a it's pseudoscience. That's not really science, but um, where, where we, um, yes, there are some unique. Okay, this is a this is an important thing. So there are lineages, there are genetic markers that are more prevalent in one population than in other, but there are not exclusive markers that are found only in one population. So, for example, with the Ashkenazi Jews DNA, you know, why do I know that my DNA belongs to the Ashkenazi Jews population? Because it's, it's in the maternal line, like this is was explaining, and this was asking. But uh, they say about 40% of uh, Ashkenazi Jews trace their ancestry to four similar mitochondrial DNA lines, right? Wow, that's cool, 40%. So if I belong to one of them, I can probably say I have Ashkenazi Jews ancestry. But what about the other 60% that identify themselves as Ashkenazi Jews and their DNA is not the typical DNA that have been um, associated with them? So, yes, there are markers that are more frequent in a population, but it's wrong to think that they're exclusive to that population. There is an African Eve and an African Adam, but didn't they live at different times? Of course they did. They, were, they, they didn't even know each other. They probably lived a few, few, few thousand or ten thousand years apart from each other. What we're talking about is the, the Y chromosome that all the men share on this planet ties back into an individual that lived about 150,000 years ago, but there were other lineages that stopped in between or in the world present before, it's similar with the mitochondrial DNA. So they were not uh, mating, these two. And there were others, you know, we know there were others. When some church authorities have said the same physical elements of our bodies during earthly life will be restored to us in the resurrection, is it possible that pertains many to our DNA and we will use that to reconstruct our physical body? I think God has a lot better DNA than what we have here. Um, and with regard to resurrection, we can really talk a long time about that, but I... I, uh, I, I yeah, I don't see. Okay, so... Okay, thank, thank you, you again.